Hi everyone, good afternoon. Let's see what's happening. We've got Kenny, hi Kenny, and Vani and Tanya and Shauna and Lynn and Belinda. If you all turn your video on, then we can see each other. That'd be great. Carell, do you know what romper room was in Australian culture? Have you ever heard of romper room? What romper is romper room? Romper room was this kids' uh, program that a lot of us grew up on. And at the end, the lady had a mirror and she used to say, I can see Peter and I can see Rod. And, I, and it was such a thrill for any child to have heard their name. Um, so, yes, you took me back. Took me back to my childhood. Oh, look at that. Rob Baroom, being, you know, Belgian, the only reference romper is Stomper. Romper Stomper the movie. It's one of the best uh, Australian films I know. And there's Lee and Yael. Welcome, guys. Um, I've been manically testing stuff over the past half hour. I don't think I figured it all out. Uh, my keynote is still playing up each time i want to share it just crashes but you know maybe now you're all there it wants to play we'll see we'll see what happens um all right so some of you were not here for last week's um stru structure class that was po possibly partially because of the tech again because emails didn't get through or you had the wrong emails and things like that that happens but let's see what you've missed i'm going to try and get that keynote back on back on the screen wish me luck okay there it is now I just get to this otherwise you're gonna to have to tell a story while i figure this out maybe you should do that yeah why not kenny tell us a story what have you seen lately that you like and that you uh, learn something from that's usually i usually ask what did you see that you learned something from because i know it's funny on my screen you're sitting right next to shauna the two of you cannot be trusted in terms of the stuff you watch and 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 learn from <laughs> uh, um wait let me think let me think what have i seen lately um god i don't know i'm, I'm drawing i'm drawing a blank I've been watching a lot of Food Wars, that, that Japanese anime that I was telling you about. <laughs> it's what I had in mind. It's exactly yeah. what I had in mind. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did you watch any of it? Um, yes. Yeah. I watched, how, how much of it have you watched? How much of it have you watched? Huh? First episode. F f one episode? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, you need to get past the first episode. But, um, but the thing is that what I find really interesting about it is that... Um, like, you know, like, like in terms of the, because I'm, I'm up to the fifth season now, right? And I think like through to four, three and four are really amazing. And when I first watched this, I was kind of like, actually, this is really much a lot like Harry Potter. And then in, in, in any third season, in terms of the things that happen, I'm like, oh my God, this is Harry Potter, you know? Um, so, so some really big things happen in the, um, like, um, in terms of story arc, but um, but what I find... Can you, can you just place it, place it for everyone? We're talking about the show, guys, talking about a show called Food Wars that is on Netflix and that is just effing insane. <laughs> it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. <laughs> but it's also it's fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but what I find really interesting from a story structure perspective, though, is that there within episodes itself a lot of episodes don't really have story structure or none that i could really pick out because a lot of it was was a lot of characters describing food <laughs> and and i'm just like i'm just watching going there's no structure in this and yet it's really compelling right 
So I'm trying. So so that's something that I'm trying to like um, reconcile. I don't know. Um, Shauna, have you watched it? Like, I just want like what what do you think in terms of uh, story structure? <laughs> that's anime for you. <laughs> yeah. I can be kind of carried through because I really love the art in it as well. I mean, the art itself is just stunning. Um, I mean, it's got some of the best depictions of food, um, particularly, mm. I mean, since Studio Ghibli. I mean, Ghibli does food amazingly as well. But these guys, yeah, the way they describe things, I think it's partly the passion of every one of the characters for the food as well. Mm. So they're just kind of nice characters doing their best and and. You know, their storylines are just kind of sweet storylines. I think you just roll with it. It's, and some it really, some really incredible um, um, uh, character arcs as well. Actually, mm, much. a lot of characters you meet as villains, right? And they're mm. all like the special skill. And, and at first, you're like, it's like, oh my god, you know, I hate that person. Don't let them look. Don't let them use their skill. And then when they become an ally later on, it's like, oh yes, let them use their skill. You know. <laughs> It's um yeah, it's really it's really interesting from that perspective. So um yeah, Karel be keen to see like if you watch end up watching more of it, what you think of a story structure and how that how that works. Yeah, I was well, thinking after our lecture last week a lot about structure. Actually, that left me the whole thing. And I can understand how sometimes it works, but then I think there are films that don't really have a structure, but they take us in somehow by their magic because they really make us feel something. And the film for me like that was the Italian film that was shown at the festival um, some years ago, La Grande Bellezia, The Great Beauty. Um, I don't know if that had any structure to it, but it was breathtaking and it left you, you know, just in this feeling of amazement. So structure works very well a lot of the time, but sometimes it's just, a feeling that something gives us that that makes a film and maybe structure with no feeling is is worse than a film that makes you feel that has no structure yeah but this is where i need to interject because that's exactly what we're going to talk about um we need to look at what we can manipulate and when you think that there is no structure you probably need to think again probably need to study it probably need to break it down, watch it again, break it down, and try to understand. Um, La Grande Bellezza, I know the film. It's not, uh, it's not the type of film that we should be discussing in a screenwriter's um, class for the simple reason that it is an auteur film. It's the type of film where you cannot control the outcome if you don't have control over the camera. So this is, this is a, an auteur film where writer director are one and the same person and um push the vision through i mean i need to check it i don't know it 100 percent for sure but i wouldn't be surprised if you look it up that that's the case because it's that sort of film um but even when you have art house films like this is pretty you know extreme uh, form of art house you're you're still going to find that some scenes are dramatic it won't be dramatic to the same extent as you will see in uh, broadly successful films, because this one is, you know, it, it's a festival film. It's not one that would get um, mainstream release, but you'll you'll still find dramatic scenes there. Um, all right, so if I'm I'm here at the <laughs> pretty much at the end of my tether uh, when it comes to oh no, hang on, no, it shows keynote on the second screen. I'm going to try and share it. If it doesn't work, I'm going to export it to PDF. I know PDF uh, doesn't pose any problem. And then we can, we can do it that way. All right, let's see if you get to see. Yes, now you see the slide that says previous masterclasses, right? I don't hear anyone. And you've just- Yes, yep. <laughs> Good. I'm looking at it's a black just... screen. Um, all right. Let's do the official part. So this is for the ones, for, for, for those of you who have not attended previous masterclasses, these are the topics that we've covered over the past um, two months or so. Just to give you an idea of the type of things we, we go over here. Yeah, last week was structure models. 
bit of an introduction today. Fractal structure. Um, oh, that's that was last week so, as well. So this week we're going to look, uh, take another look at the tension graph. We're going to go into a bit more detail there, and we're going to apply it to that sequence model that we settled for last week, and then I'll demonstrate how story structure is fractal. We'll look at the core pattern that most of you already know, which is character, event, and action. And then we'll go to something that I don't think any of you have heard this uh, from me as yet. That's what I would call the cinematic DNA. And that's the missing link in the, the core pattern that, that you all know from me. And, and that is also a uh, fractal. So that's for this week. Okay. You're familiar with this one. And that's a tension graph. And remember, we collapsed it. And we said, when you collapse it, we have these peaks for the three-act structure. Now, at the end of the class, we said, we need a more granular structure similar to the graph of you know, uh, the stock market. And if you were to, if you were to connect a, a film viewer to the equivalent of a lie detector and measure their blood pressure and their heart rate and their breathing over the course of a movie, and you were to quantify that on a chart, you would have something similar to this. Um, this is, I think, the Dow Jones over the you know, past few years, since 2018, I think. Um, and you, you'll see big patterns there, but if you, if you zoom in, you see the same patterns um, you know, smaller. That's basically the, the fractal nature of it all. But what I want to say is we want to go more granular. We want to see those fi that fine detail. And then we're going to determine how deep we want to go. Because when you do an analysis of a film, some are just too coarse. I don't think Sid Field would be helpful today. I think that's just too, too coarse. And last week, I gave you the example of the hero's journey with the 2,200 steps. That's probably too detailed to still uh, use functionally when you analyze your story. So we're going to look at the big patterns, the big peaks, and we'll, we'll see that that kind of falls together with the, the, the eight sequence uh, structure. And, and I think, Shona, you were analyzing Little Miss Sunshine the other day, and you came to the conclusion that that seems to also fall into that eight sequence pattern. Now, that's not coincidence. Well, it, it is coincidence to, to a degree, because the eight sequence structure is an average. So there are lots of movies that have more and lots of movies that have less um, sequences and that still work. We can also debate where a sequence starts and ends and different people may have diff different opinions about how many sequences there actually are in that film. And someone may want to go more granular and, and find that what you think is one sequence is actually made up of two, two smaller ones. So we settle for the eight sequence structure because it's manageable. It makes sense. And each of these sequences has a certain function and a certain mood. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, the bigger picture. Does anyone know what the red thing is and what the green thing represents? Any thoughts? There? It's, is the red the catalyst? Correct. The red is the event. And what's the green? It's the end of act one. The green is the action. So I love to speak in almost Aristotelian terms where a story is one action. An action that begins with a catalyst. Something that sets the story in motion and that is something that happens to the character. That's an event. So hence that CEA, character event action uh, model. And that is the core pattern. That's what you, if you keep analyzing, no matter what level you look at, this is the core pattern that you'll see. So event followed by action. Something happens to a character, that's a change we spoke about last week. And then the action responding to that change to either go back to how things were previously as we like, you know, we like the status quo, or we want to improve things. That's what, that's what our characters do. Now, if you then zoom in, you'll see that there are events in that big action part. At the end of act one, there is an event that then pushes the character into action. 
in Act 2. Around the midpoint reversal, there is another big event that then pushes the character to change their approach. And towards the end of Act 2, there's another event that pushes the character to their lowest point, the all is lost moment. So you see that that pattern of event and action is um, omnipresent. It's everywhere. Now, if you were to look at, you know, if you go back, the, obviously there's never nothing on the screen. So if you look at the white bits that I hadn't filled in, if you look carefully, they'll also be filled and effectively there'll be small events and actions. And it's not just um, uh, blanket green, that there'll be smaller events as well. But the big events are where, where you see them now. So that's kind of like the, the traditional story structure model you know, this is the, the six stages, familiar for those who study Michael Haig. So you have first sequence of act one, then you have the event or the inciting incident, then we have the second sequence. Then we have the first half of act two leading to the midpoint reversal. Then we go to the second half of act two, some call that act three, if you look in a four act model. Uh, then you have your lowest point. Then you have your climax, that's where the action is a little bit bigger. Then you have a, an event in that climax that restores, um, it could be, you know, the death of the, of the shadow character. And then the final action is usually just showing the new normal. So this is like the, the simplification, simplified representation of this recurring pattern of event and action as laid out over the eight sequence structure. <laughs> Tanya said it was not, it was not the Dow Jones, it was the Australian stock market. Um, could be. I think that they may have been fairly similar this year in terms of the big movements. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about that different feel because what I'm going to give you now in terms of the eight sequences, you can apply to pretty much every occurrence of this bigger event and action um, uh, dynamic, whether it is a feature film, whether it is a TV show episode, particularly if it's an, an episodic type, you know, a, a, a procedural or something. Uh, but you also have it on, in, in smaller, uh, smaller form. A sequence can be made up of the same beats and a scene can be made up of the same beat. I'll show you that later on with an example. So the first sequence in a film is the introduction to the characters to clarify who is this story about? Who's the point of view we're gonna see this through? At the end of that sequence, we then have the event. That's usually followed by the character's response. The immediate response is usually denial, um, uh, resistance, Rarely immediate action. Now, if you have this pattern on a smaller scale, if it happens in a scene, obviously you don't have the same time, the character may respond immediately. There may not be that think, think um, moment. They may venture straight into the action, which in the feature film is sequence C. So sequence C is the commencement, it's the start of the big action. It's the first attempt to solving the problem. The end of that sequence, usually it fails. And then D is trying harder. Not changing the approach, just try the same thing, but with more force. And I think in a previous masterclass, I gave the, told you the anecdote about um, the Italian nonna in Belgium who um, couldn't speak the language, but you have to go back to that one because it would take me too far. Then we have the midpoint reversal, which is an event that leads us into sequence E, where the character usually does change their approach. And I repeat, this structure is fractal. So this, the same patterns you may discover in a feature, you may discover them in a scene, but you could just as well discover them over the course of a whole televised season. And in the Sydney Screenwriters Meetup group, Recently, we had a look at the eighth season of Homeland, and we talked through a few of those uh, beats there. So the sixth sequence is the lowest point, um, ending 
usually also in, in some sort of event. Then the, the event is a breakthrough, gives the character a spark of hope or potentially an, an item um, um, or a clue, uh, a piece of information. That then leads us into the final big action, sequence G, the climax of whatever you know, story element we're talking about. Could be the story, the, the climax of the film, climax of the scene. And then you have, you often have an aftermath scene return with the elixir, it's called in the hero's journey. And there too, uh, when we looked at the, that scene from Charlie Wilson's War in which Aaron Sorkin sets up the character of Gust, we see a beautiful return uh, with the elixir there after the climax and that is within one scene. So it's a scene of three minutes that literally has all those uh, uh, story elements. Now what is this? This is a casualty of the pandemic. It is my business card. So we don't hand out business cards anymore. I used to use this in my story classes since the, um, the logo at the bottom story series. And I used to hand those out to the students as a gift during the, the, the hero's journey class. Because there is a hero's journey stage where the mentor gives the hero a gift and this was my gift to the students. It's a business card with, with a structure model. Now, this was for the believers. There's also a version for the non-believers that's black and white, that doesn't use the hero's journey terminology, but it talks about those eight stages in general psychological terms. So first being the hero intro, ending in some sort of shock, followed by a think-think sequence, then the plan uh, and action, beginning of act two, trying harder, sequence four, the reversal, a new approach in five, often as some sort of public redemption towards the end of six, return, and battle, that's the big climax, and then the happily ever, ever after at the end. Now, I have a gift for you as well. If at the end of this class, you send me an email, tell me what you like from this class, I will send you these two business cards, at least the um, electronic version of them, so you can keep them for reference. All right, so you, you get an idea now of this fractal structure, these moments that we know from feature film, you will also be able to discover in a um, TV episode or even in a scene. And for those who use be it my uh, story series, and Lynn is at least one of them. Good to see you, Lynn. I think Kenny was there as well in the, back in the day. Deepak, I think Deepak was there. Yeah. McCool was there. So yeah, quite a few people here on the uh, masterclass, remember five years ago in the story series, there was one clip that I love showing because it was so powerful. It demonstrated this uh, notion incredibly well. And I'm not going to show you the whole clip today. I'm gonna just cycle you through it so YouTube doesn't uh, block us. All right, so that's that. Um, uh, Toy Story 2 clip. Now, I'll, t I'll tell you the story as I walk you through the images. Okay, so Hero is Woody. Woody is a toy cowboy who wakes up from a nightmare on this shelf. And he wakes up next to a toy he had never seen for a long time. He hadn't seen for a long time. That's Wheezy. And the reason he hadn't seen Wheezy is Wheezy is sick. He's got asthma. And the dust aggrav aggravates his, uh, his condition. And so they're talking. And then um, Woody notices there's a yard sale outside. The yard sale is every year, tw twice a year. And the toys have a drill. They know how to respond to this yard sale because it's a time of danger. Toys that are no longer wanted may be discarded. So Wheezy is in trouble. So that's a foreshadowing of what might happen to Wheezy. So emergency roll call, all the toys line up, do what they're supposed to do. Then mother comes in. Mother comes in with a box and starts collecting toys that are broken or that the kids don't play with anymore. And yes, there it happens. She takes Wheezy. Wheezy is being taken away. And Woody obviously panics. 
and there is a think think moment. This is the think think. He says it literally. The same words John McLean uses in Die Hard for the, the students of the immersion screenwriting course. In that second sequence of Die Hard, McLean says, think, think, literally the same. Woody says, and numerous film characters in the history of cinema at this particular point in the story. And you may have never noticed it, and now I've ruined that moment because each time it happens now, you will think, oh, we will be at the end of sequence A and going into sequence B. Think, think. Oh, yeah. And he knows what to do. To do. He whistles. And together with Buster, the dog, he's going outside. That's the end of Act 1. The end of the scene in the, uh, the room, the tutorial room, the, the playroom, kids' room, which is their ordinary world. So they leave the ordinary world. It's very, very mythical. It's very um, hero's journey, uh, Campbellian. So they leave. And this is the, it's a threshold journey. So it's a... It's a a genuine travel down the stairs into the special world where the toys don't go, which is outside, which is outside. And there are allies and enemies, mostly enemies. And so the, the objective is to rescue Wheezy. Now, where is Wheezy? So he's to find Wheezy. The toys watch this. Woody's figured it out. There's the box, climbs in the box, which is the end of act two, it is the ordeal. This is the cave. This box is where toys go to die. And if you didn't believe that, or if you didn't notice that, then the dialogue of the, the toys confirms it. Because I think it's Rex the dinosaur who says, when Woody reappears, he says, ah, it was not a suicide mission. So the, the notion of death is mentioned at this particular point. And this is only a three minute sequence. Yet you have a complete hero's journey with all those stages here. So now what, what usually happens after the, the lowest point and the, the ordeal, the hero gets the reward, which in this case is Wheezy. Wheezy is the boon. Um, he puts Wheezy back on Buster and commences the final threshold back to the ordinary world where normally in, in a film, the climax would take place. But this is not the whole film. This is just a three minute scene. So it's going to be aborted. So here, when Woody falls off the dog, this is where the scene is aborted. And we, we realize that this is only part of a bigger scene. Now, what's the irony of this particular story? What's the irony of these three minutes in Toy Story 2? Does anyone remember? So he needs to uh, Woody. He, he needs to Yeah, the exact same thing that happened to Wheezy is going to happen to Woody only in a bigger way. Now, Woody falls down, girl picks him up, the mother takes it because it's broken, throws him on the uh, table, and here behind Woody, you see the back of the collector. That's the shadow character who's going to kidnap Woody. And so the, the whole story that we've just seen played out in three minutes is now going to replicate itself on the bigger scale. So Toy Story 2 is the story of Woody being taken away and all the other uh, uh, toys trying to save him. So that is the fractal, the fractal nature demonstrated in Toy Story 2, beautifully demonstrated. So you can see an entire hero's journey in three minutes. Um, in the same way it would play out over, a, big, over a, a longer period of time. Are there any questions up to this point? No, okay. This is where I wanted to go into the next part, the, the part that is new, that I haven't taught here yet. Let me see if this... Oh, yeah. McCool is asking, what is the midpoint of the Toy Story 2 scene? It's a good question. I don't think there is a clear midpoint. Um, I think w we are with uh, the toys where that would normally happen. Not, I mean, beca because we're on that smaller scale and we're not on the feature film level, um, you always find a midpoint reversal 
Uh, if the, as you go bigger, you'll find it. There is a midpoint reversal in Toy Story 2. I haven't analyzed the whole film for a long time and I don't recall, but it has something to do with that moment when Woody sits with Jessie and, and Jessie sings her a song. I think it's a wake up call and it's um, uh, Woody realizing where, where he is and, and what course of action he needs to take. But it's a song, it's Jessie's song halfway Toy Story 2, which is the midpoint for that, for that film. Um, all right, so I'm going to dive a little bit more deeply now into that fractal structure and let's see if I can share with that thing crashing here. Stop two. So, yeah, it works. And now I can see the, the slides as well. All right. So remember, so this was the big picture with the event and the action. What were the eight sequences? This wasn't what matters. This is the replicatable. That's the fractal uh, part of it. Remember, event and action. Now we're going to talk about what I would like to call the cinematic DNA. I believe that this is the core of all drama that we see on the screen. An event happens to a character and the character responds to it. It's always visible. It's always on the screen. Events cannot ever predate the story. If you're talking about the event that uh, kickstarts the story, you know, if you're talking about the call to adventure, there are smaller events, obviously, that will have happened to the character in the past. There's an event that causes the wound that may not be in the story. But the event that causes the main action for this particular story must be on the screen. So both event and action are on the screen. This is the story. This is the cinematic story. Now you notice that they don't connect. When we looked at the eight sequence structure, there was a sequence in between those two. And we cannot ignore that. When we talk about this DNA, this, this core structure of drama, we must look at that, that particular part. And in the past, I've at some point said that counterintuitively, drama for the screen is not visual. It is not visual. In fact, people who are overly obsessed with the visual, usually don't create films for the masses. Um, La Grande Bellezza is, as it says, it's a great beauty, but it's not a film for the masses because it does not follow this core DNA, dramatic DNA for, for the screen. And in order to understand what is going on here and to have the full picture, why event and action are so important, we need to zoom in. We need to go and take our electron microscope and there we go. We're zooming in on that space in between the event and the action because something happens there only it's not on the screen. It's invisible. It's happening in our minds and it is happening in the minds of the characters. But it is a result of the event. If you wrote a great event, then in that space between events and the action, something really, really important happens. And if it's not there, your film will not work. And there are tons of films that are written towards this structure, that are, that are following this model or pattern or formula, if you wish, but they don't work. And it's because that, that space in between the event and the action is a void. There's not what should be there. Now, what does need to be there? Two things. The event creates something in the mind of the character that we understand, because obviously the character is fictional, but we project our own response to that event onto the character. And then as a result, the character is going to do something. And here's what's missing. As a, resu as a result of the event, there's an emotion. As a result of the emotion, there's a decision. And only once that decision is taken, decision is made, the character will act. But th they are critical. They're not visible on the screen, but they are implied and they are part of that DNA. 
So when, when we talk about events and actions, we use those to diagnose scripts and it works quite well. The question is obviously, is this event suitable for the story? Is this event having an emotional impact? And if it doesn't, there's no emotion and there's no decision. Now, it needs to be reasonable for an audience to infer the emotion and the decision from the event. So in a screenplay, and we won't do that in this masterclass, we'll do that in a future masterclass, we'll look at examples where some writers will write the emotion and will write a decision in the screenplay. Other writers just write the event and trust that the reader will understand what the emotion is that follows from it. If you have a character who loses a child in the story, then we don't need to specify that that character is going to be harmed, is going to be um, you know, in distress, is going to be emotionally impacted by that event. If there's another event that is less uh, drastic, uh, less extreme, maybe you need to write the emotion to clarify to your reader that it's happening right there. The decision itself, if you understand who the character is, you may understand that there will be a decision, but you will only know for sure when you see the action, the action that follows um, the, uh, the event. So there is a void, on the screen is a void, and that, that is the think-think. It's what happens in the, in, the, in the mind of the character. So the emotion leads to the think-think, the think-think leads to a decision, and the decision leads to an action. Once we see the action, sometimes that is the, the first and only confirmation that this process happened because we didn't see it on the screen. So there you go. That is, that is, in my view, the cinematic DNA where the event is visible, the action is visible, the emotion and the decision are invisible. Now think about these. Think about the emotion. The emotion is an invisible event. An emotion is something the character has no control over. So it's something that happens to the character internally as a result of what happens externally. The decision is a mental action. It's an internal action. We don't see it, but it is something the character has control over. So you have an external event leading to an internal event, leading to an internal action, leading to an external action. And there you go. So we've just found the missing link there. And that is part of the DNA of every story, no matter the scale you're looking at, whether that is um, Don Cobb in Inception, considering the offer from Saito to uh, do Inception for the second time. So the, the, it, there may not be anything happening on the screen, but we understand that it's happening in his mind before he agrees, before he makes a decision. It, on the much smaller scale, we see Woody respond to the taking away of Wheezy. We see his emotion, we see his decision. Actually, we don't see his decision, we see the result of his, his decision. And there you go, in the two-act structure, or after the midpoint reversal, we have the exact same thing playing out again. A strong event, followed by emotion, decision, and then action on the screen. All right. Now, let that sink in. Any questions about it? Uh, yeah, just so it does. Um, does there need to be a, a time gap between the event and the action? Like, like you say, we don't have to see the um, the emotion and the, the decision, but does there have to be? Does that have to consist of uh, like a scene or multiple scenes? That that gap. It'll be different for every story. You know, if you look at Blade Runner, there is no, there's virtually no gap. He gets the job, he, he, he takes the job. He does. In my view, that is, by the way, it's, it's a, a, to, to my understanding, that's, an, that's a weakness and it may be one of the reasons why, one of the reasons that, I've, that contributed to the failure of the first Blade Runner as a commercial, uh, as, a, as a box office release. Mm -hmm. Because that there is not a lot of emotion that is obviously justified philosophically by suggesting that Descartes is a, is a replicant. But it doesn't help the audience because the audience bought a ticket to go to the movies and feel emotions. 
So it's, it's really about that void that the, the experience is all about. That's where the emotion is. So that, that, and that's why I say cinema is not visual. The real emotion is in the void between the, visu the, the visual um, events and actions on the screen. And we need, to be, we need to be relatively confident that there will be emotion. You know, not just, you can't just create any event. I mean, the structure is, it's nice and, and, you know, it may be enticing to use it to analyze your stories, but you need to be aware that that event needs to have an emotional impact on, on the character that you've just created. And that's why that first sequence is there. That's what that whole sequence is about, to set that up, to, so, to make us understand what sort of character do we have here so that when that event happens that we go like, oh, shit, not with this character. They're, they're not going to respond well to it, right? So we can anticipate that emotion. Um, I wanted to look at the script for um, the scene that I talk about a lot, the one from um, Charlie Wilson's War, and show you that that uh, uh, DNA, the structure on the page. So let's, let's have a look, see if I can dig that up. Um, I don't trust Keynote for that. Most of you will know what I'm talking about. All right, here's the script. Can I ask a quick question before we move on, Carol? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead do you, do you, what, which do you think is stronger with placing that emotion? Do you think it's the lead that we, as script writers, give the character and, and the build-up of expectation of what the character is going to do or what the audience brings in from home um, and their expectation. And I link this to relatability, I think, as well, just not to try and muddy it too much, but success is if this character's going to do something that I relate to is, oh, I'm in. And I can see that being the... Yeah. That's the Share, you, know, you can play with that. And, and it, you, you will yeah. assume a shared culture. I'll give you an example. Uh, you can layer this, right? Certain things you must set up within the story. And that's something Aristotle said as well. You know, your story needs to be, uh, it needs to have a certain integrity. You cannot assume too much from outside the story. It needs to be self-contained. It needs to yeah. be all there, right? So if you're going to use something, set it up in your story. Don't rely on external stuff. But I've been, yeah. I've been raving about Yellowstone over the past few days and binging that show. I love it. And there is a, there's a reference that did require some knowledge from a, outside the series. And it's when the seventh episode of uh, the first season started with a particular tune. Uh, a, a very gentle, subtle guitar theme. And it, it seemed innocent. But for those who recognize that guitar theme, they would have realized that this was going to be a big episode. Because it was the it was the theme music for Unforgiven, the the western okay. by um, Clint Eastwood, a, a tune that Clint Eastwood wrote himself for that for that film. So I had a, immense expectation. So the emotion was there immediately. My wife had no idea what I was talking about. The episode still worked for her because there was enough in that episode that was self-contained to deliver the um, the payoff at the end. But for me. The tension was there right from the first few seconds because of that setup. You see? Now, yeah, here, Taylor Sheridan chose to take something externally. You can take things from, you know, the shared, the shared culture that, that you and your audience live in, but you can also use something you set up earlier in the film or in, earlier in your show. Okay, so you, you can draw from pretty much anywhere. However, as Hitchcock said, make sure your audience understands. Make sure your audience has the information so they, they can have the emotion because that's what it's all about. 
you cannot have the emotion if you don't have the information. And you're, you you know, if you if you trust your audience, if they're all, if you, you know, you know, they're all fans, then you can rely on external references. You know, if, if you say, um, you know, you have a, a sequel to Wolf Creek uh, and your character stops at the motel and the motel is called Bates Motel, then, uh, you know, the, the fans get, get the reference, right? But the fans, you know, the kids today in their 20s, they w wouldn't have a clue unless they're film buffs, unless they go to film school. That's a good question. Definitely a good question. So, yeah, give, give the information. So make sure that that emotion in that void between the event and the action is understood. Now, as writers, your job is to make sure the reader understands. And that's why sometimes you see that cheating. You see on the page the, the writer describe what's going on in the mind of the character. And then it's really a matter of whether the reader is going to accept that that's going to be reasonably understood by the audience, right? Um, there is an example that I've, I've given many times in my, in my classes as well. It's Avatar, the midpoint reversal, uh, where Jake meets with the colonel. And um, um, I thought, do I have it here? No, I thought I had it here. And... Um, Cameron describes what um, Jake is thinking. Now, in, in every screenwriting class, you will hear that, that you can't do that. Actually, I did find it. I'll, I'll show it. And he does it anyway. So here we go. So what you need to know. In the first half of Avatar, the character of Jake is sent to this moon of Jupiter to gather information from the natives <clears throat> so they can be removed and the military can clear the ground for mining. In the first half of the film, Jake has done just that, but along the way, he's also struck a, a relationship with one of the natives. And if they're going to be removed, that's going to be disastrous. So basically his new girlfriend might get killed. That's the harsh reality. So in this scene, he meets with his, with his colonel, who was also his mentor. And the mentor basically tells Jake, um, it's all done. We're going to go in. He literally, he says, uh, when it turns into a shit fight, which it will. So there will be war. So Jake feels hollow inside knowing what he's done. So that is a description of the internal uh, of, the, of the character. You wouldn't typically do that. But if you followed, if you weren't asleep in the first half of Avatar, you'll get it. So the, this is an event. What the colonel says is a strong event. That event leads to an emotion. And that emotion, we understand. We don't need to see it. It is... Um, it's... Um, I'm thinking about the actor is not the most expressive actor. And that's okay because we, we get it, you know, we get the moment. And then here again, so Jake ponders this. We can see him ponder, but then this we don't see. Is this what he was doing all this for? So there's a lot of invisibles there, but you get away with it because it is reasonable to assume that the, the reader will understand. If you're unsure, violins do add those lines in italics where you cheat a little bit, you help the reader to either um, remember what happened previously or, you know, what the, the emotion is supposed to be here. Um, I did have the other script. Yeah, from Charlie Wilson's War. Some of you watch it with me. So it's a story of, or this particular scene, it's a three minute scene in which we see a new character introduced, and he's a, a CIA agent called Gust, Gust Avacados, Avacados. And he's asked to come to his superior's office um, because his superior is going to apologize. That's what he thought. But then he hears that his superior is expecting an apology from him, which is an event. 
Um, this is Sorkin, so everything is very clear from the dialogue. So, you know, where you, in, in certain scenes, you would have visible action. Here it is verbal action. And we see the emotion expressed in, in the dialogue. Now, this scene has a clear first act break when the maintenance man comes in. Here, excuse, maintenance man, excuse me. Yes, does this look all right? So the, the conversation is interrupted. And that means the first act of this conversation is over. The first act was all about the confusion, whether this was going to be an apology to or an apology from. Then we have the maintenance man uh, bit, and then he exits. Now we are in the second act of this scene, in which Gust is going to plead that he should have been the Helsinki station chief. And that's what that, what that whole scene is about. It's about him pleading that he should have gotten that job there is a midpoint reversal when um, he realizes that things are personal, that he was not chosen because of who he is. And that's interesting because um, going back to Little Miss Sunshine, um, Shona, when you analyzed uh, Richard's arc at the midpoint reversal, he also realizes that he cannot do the book deal because it's, it's about him. And that's the, the problem is not with the book. The problem is with him. And that's not something he can, he can fix. In this scene, Gus then changes his approach. And he plays it personally. He plays it back to um, his superior. Um, and he pl you know, plays with fire, basically. He, he might lose his job. That's what Graver says. Get out of my office before I end your career. And that's the end of Act 2. It's the lowest point of the scene. And again, we have this threshold. We have a clear act break when the maintenance man comes back. So Sorkin structures this scene again as not just as a three-act structure, but a hero's journey because at the end, and this is not in the screenplay, when Gus walks out of the office, the scene is over, he's being praised by his peers. So he's revered as the, the, the hero. So he's a true hero. He stood up against his superior in the climax of this mini story. And um, he comes out the hero. So you have that return with the elixir in a three-minute scene. So contrary to the, the Toy Story 2 scene, which was aborted, this one has its conclusion. It has a complete three-act structure with a, 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 a hero's journey, a return with the elixir, which is rare. And the, the reason it's rare is because it typically slows down the pace a little bit. Charlie Wilson's World is not a successful film for other reasons, I'd say, but... Yeah, when you structure your, your film, you want to immediately go into the next. So Sorkin had it, didn't have it in this script, and it was probably, I mean, it's a nice moment. It's only like, what, three seconds or so. Um, all right. You know, that is, that is, that's all you need to know. And that's a great thing about this fractal structure. You just need to understand the principle. And you can learn that principle, it doesn't matter what level, what scale you learn it on, because it, you can apply it on every, every other level. And um, if you had time, we could even look at sentences in dialogue, where often the first part of the sentence is not that important. It's more about signaling to the, the viewer and the other character in the, in the conversation that we're going to say something. Then it is being said, and in the same way the structure of the scene with Gus was. And at the end of the sentence, your final word is usually the most important word. If you want to improve your dialogue, that's how you do it. You make sure that the most important word of the whole sentence is at the end. Belinda, it's different for novelists. Because you read an, when you read a novel, you will see the whole sentence you don't read, um, we do read from left to right, but we actually see more words in one go than we can hear when we listen to a film. So a film is time-based, so we need to wait until we hear the final word. In a novel, it's different. You, you can actually have that most important word elsewhere. It's still important. I mean, it's still effective, and particularly for people who are auditory inclined. They will hear the dialogue in their, in their ears. Um, so it's, it's not a bad technique, but it's, it's not as mandatory in uh, novel writing. Yeah, Shona. Oh, sorry, I need to allow you guys to speak. Uh, yeah, you should be able to speak. 
Yeah, I, that was actually what was drummed into us too when I was studying um, Shakespearean performance as well, is that the end of the line, the last word is the one that you, you have to rest on and, and emphasize as well. So, yeah, same, same principle. Yeah. And it is the, it's the principle of anticipation. It's the principle of building tension. While you're speaking, you're building tension because the, re the audience wants to know what you're going to say and you don't give it to them. You don't give it to them until the end. And then so you, you keep the tension up. It's the graph. It's the tension graph again on the, on the sentence level. And the final word climaxes it and resolves the tension. Good. We're at the end of today's class. Any other questions? Um, I was just going to ask in regards to the Toy Story 2 scene again, just thinking yeah. over the structure um, as a hypo hypothetical alternative, would you say that instead of having full um, eight sequences in that scene, it actually has um, six sequences and then at the end of sequence F, Woody falls off Buster and then it starts the next sequence and therefore you could adjust it and you could say that the uh, him going into the box is part of the midpoint because it's sort of a negative as he's fighting stuff and then the positive of it's not a suicide mission, which reflects the ending being sort of a down ending of that part of the story. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. That does make sense. You know, the, it, we, we opened with a super granular stock chart, right? <laughs> That's for a long form. The smaller, you, the shorter your uh, clip is going to be, the less beats you're going to have. And we could essentially go over those and see which ones are going to drop off first most of the time. But um, yeah, it, it does make sense. I, I could put in the chat what I wrote down for the yeah, thank you. breakdown of the sequence. And, yeah, great. And, awesome. And, uh, um, all right, I've, we, while you all think about questions, I'm going to quickly uh, give you an, an overview of what we're going to cover over the next few weeks, because obviously I would love you to, oh, that's the wrong, this is the wrong screen. But yeah, it doesn't want to do it again, I don't know why. I'll just do it verbally then. That next course for immersion is going to cover um, topics like today, we start next week on Friday and uh, we'll go for seven weeks. Among the topics will be character introductions. How do you introduce a character into the story and how you write that on the page? We'll also talk about reading scripts, um, the way you read scripts in immersion, but also the way screen uh, assessors, screen uh, play assessors read their scripts. We'll have one session entirely dedicated to writing the first draft of your script, one to using flashbacks, one about character arcs, one about great antagonists. And at the very end, at the end of, um, that'll be October, yeah? There'll be um, a session about pitching, pitching skills. And you can either sign up for immersion if you haven't already done that. That's $199 US. That, will, that includes the master classes every Friday or Saturday morning if you miss it. Um, and um, yes, you have access to the to the course for six months. It's a course that you can typically do in five week in seven weeks. Some of you have done. Most of you have done the course. Um, and if you want to stay with the master classes, you can also book for a whole year. Uh, sorry, for six months. At, at $99. So it's $49 for seven, which is only $7 per week, which not too much, I'd say. Or for six months, you pay $99, and that'll be, you work it out, three courses. So it'll be about 20, 21 uh, classes. And it, the, the topics are different each time. So I have a total of about 50 topics. So in order to um, hear them all, you need to stick with us for a whole year. Um, McCall just posted that structure. Woody wakes up from the nightmare. End of uh, A is, yeah, Wheezy gets taken. Then think, think, correct. They head out into the yard. That is the threshold. I'd say start looking for Wheezy. That would be C. 
when he goes into the 25 cents box. Ah, I would make that E. The box, going into the box, the, the reason I make that E, it's, it's an approach to the inmost cave. And that usually starts at the midpoint reversal. It's when the character is willing to sacrifice themselves. So when Woody is willing to go into the box to save Wheezy, he's actually risking selling himself, having himself sold. So that is an approach to the inmost cave. In the eight sequence structure, that would be an E. Um, not a suicide mission, Woody gets Wheezy out. I would call that the reward, which is at the end of F. It's at the end of the lowest point. Woody, Wheezy, and Buster head back towards the house. That is the beginning of G. That's the return. Um, that's the, the road back home in Hero's Journey. Um, and then, yeah, there's an A again. Woody gets picked up by a girl. Very good. Beck asks, is it 40, 49 if we are to continue for another six, seven weeks? Correct. That's right. Yep. $49 for seven weeks and 99 for half a year. All right, um, I'll give you the, I mean, you got the emails. In, in the email, you have the link, so don't think you, you need them here. Um, don't forget, I, I will send you my business cards with a structural overview. If you tell me one thing you learned today, one thing you enjoyed today that you thought it was worth attending for. Okay, my email address, you've got it. Just reply to the email that you received today. Final question? Questions? Oh no, oops. Shona, go ahead. Um, it's, it's sort of a comment actually. The, um, what you've just described with the, um, the example of Wheezy, that he's, he's being kidnapped, then sort of mirroring what then becomes the whole story. It's quite interesting how often you see that in um, horror films, actually, particularly with monster horror, because you have that first victim that that completes the whole thing where they're, they're killed by the creature. But often that has that, that sort of, I, I imagine that they probably make use of that kind of structure the build and everything to, to create tension and then it happens so that then the audience is primed for what their heroes are going to then potentially be up, up against. Precisely. It is Hitchcock's principle of anticipation. If you know what's going to happen, your tension, your experience will be far more elevated than if you don't know. You know, surprise is not as powerful as anticipation, as suspense. Is that a kind of foreshadowing? Definitely, yeah. 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 I saw it's it, foreshadowing. You know. It's an unconscious foreshadowing because we, we don't know that this is what's going to happen. But we've seen it, so it may, it may happen again. So this is, this is possible in the world of this story. Mm. Because I saw a, uh, recently an analysis of um, Alien, the first Alien, about how the very opening scene has like a sublim subliminal foreshadowing in it because at the, at the start where they... Um, where like, you know, they wake up from hypersleep that the, the camera goes onto like the helmet, the pilot's helmet, and the helmet's meant to look as though it's got a, it's got a face, a face hugger on it. That's, that's like, that's like a foreshadowing. And then there's like a little elephant chain that looks sort of looks like a face hugger as well. I don't know. I that's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, that, that's probably, yeah. You know, that sort of thing is rarely unintentional because films are crafted over such a long time nothing is in there by accident mm -hmm. um, another good example of pretty much exactly the same is uh, total recall where you have the whole story of total recall in the beginning uh, as a dream we don't we don't know that this is actually what's going to play out obviously that then becomes part of the story you know it may all have been a dream probably it was and you may or may not remember it you know, you may, may or may not realize at the end that it was all a dream. If you do it too, if it's too obvious, part of your audience will be disappointed if it was only a dream, you know, if it didn't really happen. But yeah, it's powerful foreshadowing. Good. We're going to wrap up here, guys. I've got another one of these to do tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Sydney time. I'm hoping to see some of you again next week. So uh, join us, sign up. Oh, by the way, yeah, um, I posted this on Facebook, but they are now also transcribed. So um, for the hearing impaired, we've got live notes. That's what you uh, see at the top here. And, um, oh, actually, no, no, I didn't turn that on. Oh, Beck, I'm so sorry about that. I did not turn it on. 
I need to activate that. It will be activated in the morning. Oh, oh, that was an oversight. Oh, well, as of next week, for the paying participants, there will be live notes. Thanks for joining. Have a great weekend. See you guys. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.